Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, one second. Sorry, Echo. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Great. Um, hi, my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm the North Brooklyn representative from uh, our New York City Steering Committee and also a proud uh, participant in the uh, North Brooklyn Political Education Committee, the best political education in all of DSA. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome uh, such a great crowd tonight um, for the launch of our night school. Um, I am just gonna say a little bit about uh, North Brooklyn political education, a little bit about our night school, and then introduce, hand things off, and introduce our uh, speaker for the night. Um, so first of all, political education. In my mind, um, you know, important, one of the great things about DSA is that we have a wide variety of ideas and visions and plans for the future, um, but we come together to act together as socialists to pursue our agenda to change the world. Um, our agreements are often more practical Uh, Jeremy, you're cutting out. Am I okay now? Um, political education is how we act as smart socialists, how we come together and uh, achieve the kind of transformation of society. It helps us achieve the kind of transformation of society that we want to achieve. How does political education do that? Political education helps us, I think, examine the values and clarify to ourselves the values we share as socialists. Political education helps us clarify our analysis of society, how socialists see the world, how we understand uh, why things are the way they are. Um, Jeremy, you're cutting out again. And am I back now? Uh, yeah, you're back now. Maybe. Um... Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, uh, I'll try without my video for a moment. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so socialist political education, we look at our, uh, our common, our values, the values that we share together. We sharpen our analysis of capitalist society and what stands in the way of our achievements and how to achieve them. And we examine our shared history, both to kind of spend time with the heroes of our movement and uh, to learn from past experience of people trying to change the world, all the way back from Spartacus, uh, slave revolts in ancient Rome, to uh, examples of social change from around the world. Um, we're in, through political education, we develop, I think together, we try to develop together the strategic thinking that helps us not only recommit to the struggle and recommit to the activism, which is why we're all in this organization, but helps us direct our energies most effectively to changing society um, and to achieving a radically different kind of society, which is what brings us all to DSA. Um, so in my mind, political education should be complementary to our activist work. Uh, it is not enough if you're only attending the night school. Everyone in DSA should be involved in our work as activists. It is also, though, I think, not enough to be an activist. We want to be as smart a socialist as we can be. Um, so I really welcome you all and thank you both uh, members from North Brooklyn, but also from uh, a wider population. Uh, obviously, that's our, our internet reality. Um, a wider population who are here to think through together tonight and in the sessions to come um, the urgent issues of our time and how to change the world. Um, a few things about night school. 
Uh, Ninth School is a two semester program uh, hosted by North Brooklyn DSA. Um, and I'll post uh, the syllabus. You probably have seen it in the link to your email, but I'll post the uh, bit.ly link in the chat um, for our syllabus. Um, we have our first semester is devoted to kind of the big ideas of socialism. So first of all, like what is democratic socialism, which is what we're coming together tonight to talk about. Um, also socialist uh, examination of the economy, economics, uh, elections and the state, race, gender and class struggle and social movements. Um, these are kind of some of the, the central core topics of socialist thought and there's a long rich tradition of learning and history to study up to understand them and to deepen our understanding of them. So we think about how do socialists participate in elections in different ways than how liberals participate in elections. What is um, the socialist uh, agenda for ending racial discrimination um, and for and racial inequality and for ending the inequalities that are uh, are attached to gender and to sexuality and to so many other oppressions in our society. Why do socialists talk about the working class and union so much? Um, these sorts of things. The second semester of night school then, which comes after the new year, we hone in on issues of our day and develop our strategic thinking about our kind of more particular agenda and how to advance it on various fronts, including neoliberalism and populism, healthcare, housing, immigration, climate change, education, and imperialism. And finally, we have a special summer school um, here in North Brooklyn, where we do a deep dive into some key historical moments in the history of left-wing politics and socialism, um, including the Russian Revolution, the New Deal, um, uh, Allende in Chile, um, the coup in Chile, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting one, it'll come to me eventually. Um, oh, uh, social democracy, European social democracy. Um, so that's broadly the night school. And um, I'll, we'll post the link at the end about the uh, next session so you can sign up, the sessions following this one. Just in terms of how we get, uh, structure our discussions and our time together um, tonight and in the future, we're going to have presentation. Uh, tonight we have an amazing guest speaker who I'll shortly introduce. Every night school starts with a presentation, either from a branch member, an activist, um, or a guest speaker. We have Q&A usually with that person, and then we break out into groups um, to have small group discussions. Um, night school is generally very discussion-based. Tonight, because we're such a big group, I think we'll do more Q&A focus, but the point really is to clarify our thoughts about socialist strategy and values and history together. Um, so we emphasize discussion. Uh, we assign readings, as you've seen, but uh, if you didn't have the time, we get it. Uh, this, these are classes for working adults. Um, they're free, which is, you know, one thing. They're free and open to all. Um, they're also, the presentations are meant to stand alone, too. So if you didn't get to the reading, don't be like, God darn, I can't show up. Um, please join us. Um, I think that's about it in terms of introducing night school. Um, and we'll talk a little more at the end about uh, the next session and the like. So I will then move to introducing Nathan. Um, so Nathan Robinson, we're really, really pleased to have him here. He's uh, editor-in-chief of Current Affairs and one of the very, uh, well, one of the reasons I thought to invite him for this, I think there were two reasons that we thought to invite him for this. One was um, he, his coverage of the 2020 primary, I think, was pretty much the best out there. Um, his pen is acerbic and cutting and brilliant. Um, when he was covering the primary, when he debates with those who do not think like socialists, uh, when he you know, uh, takes apart the libertarian arguments against socialism, these kinds of things. Nathan is a journalist and a commentator to be reckoned with um, of our time, a socialist commentator. And also he, of course, wrote a... Uh, a very readable book, um, which, you know, not all socialist books are very readable, but this one is. Um, and I will put it on my video. Uh, it's Why You Should Be a Socialist. I have it here and it's terrific. I recommend everyone read it um, and give it to your friends and family to read because it's that kind of a book, a book meant to be a primer 
on basic socialist values and uh, program and sort of where we can go from here. Um, so I think that's about it. Uh, again, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us and launching our night school. And I will hand it over to Nathan. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. That was a really, really generous and kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I'm Nathan. Uh, it is a, a real privilege uh, to be with you. It's, it, I mean, to to get to to launch the night school is it, it is it, it is really an honor, and 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 part of that is because um, socialism has such a rich. Uh, intellectual and historical tradition and body of writing, and there are so many incredible socialist thinkers and and writers that to be you know to be to be the first one to start you off is uh, is, is something. And so th also thank you to Doug for uh, for getting me uh, getting me here. I wished I could have been here. We were supposed to be here all together, in reality, uh, uh, maybe sometime. Um, so. Uh, Jer Jeremy's introduction uh, talked about um, how Unite School is going to focus on socialist values, socialist analysis, and socialist actions. And that's kind of what I want to talk about um, in, in this speech. And then we can talk about whatever you like in the, in the Q&A session. Um, I think one of the reasons that I was picked to, to lead this off is I'm, I'm not necessarily... Um, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not the socialist you choose in the middle of the semester because I often write in a way for non-socialists. I'm very much an introductory writer today because I think of myself as being, my part is to explain socialism to other people and to really find the simplest ways to express what those values are and what the analysis is and, and then what the actions are that uh, socialists take. And in the course of writing this book, which I, I originally titled Socialism for People Who Are Extremely Skeptical of It, because it is not targeted at socialists, it's targeted at non-socialists, but I had to think, I had to refine my own understanding. I had to think, you know, because in order to explain something, you really have to understand it. So I had to try and figure out, you know, what is the... The, the term socialism has been argued about for as long as there has been a socialist tradition. So where do we, where do we begin with that term and where do we begin with what we are? And I've actually interviewed DSA members all across the country over the last year or so and trying to get at what is in common. What do all socialists have in common? Where do they begin? And uh, the place that pretty much every socialist begins is with a feeling of revulsion or disgust at certain features of the society that surrounds them, right? Every socialist is a discontented person. They are a person, I mean, which is actually unusual, right? Especially in the United States, right? A lot of people, even though it is a time of great, great suffering and misery, but there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who just go about their lives without asking why things are the way they are. And socialists are always, always people who want to know why things are the way they are. They never stopped asking the questions that you're supposed to stop asking after a, a child. They, they thought the answers were unsatisfactory. So socialists have feelings of, uh, of discontent, and they have a feeling that something is very, very wrong around them, and that people who go along with it have something. There's something, something very, something is very amiss. Usually, that's where it starts. And you know, they look at the socialists tend to look at uh, gross inequality as because it's the, the greatest, the most obvious manifestation of what is wrong. As they pick up. Um, the Wall Street Journal has a real estate section called Mansion, where they talk about uh, that, that I get every Friday, um, and you can see, you know, it's forty-three room houses with, uh, you know, nineteen car garages, and you look at that, and of course, and then you know people in your life um, who are having to uh, figure out whether they can afford to even go and get their teeth looked at uh, when when they have a severe toothache, um, and you think this is this is incredibly wrong. This, these these two things, there's there's a disjunction here, and so there's this. The beginning of socialism is, is pre-theoretical, right? There's a lot of socialist theory and, and analysis, but the beginning is kind of pre-theoretical, which is just um, looking at uh, you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, looking at inequality, uh, looking at, of course, socialists have always um, really noticed that they begin with a, a class analysis. They understand class. They understand that there, there is a relationship between uh, the people who give the orders and the people who take the orders. And socialists 
you know, socialists are by definition, I mean, some of us, we, we don't, we try and avoid the term utopian because no one wants to be a utopian because because it implies that what you want can't happen. But there is something deeply utopian about all socialists, which is that when they look about and see those things that are, are discontented, that they can't reconcile themselves to, um, they also have this belief that it is, it is, there is nothing necessary about human nature that makes the, what we see um, mandatory, right? There's nothing, it, it can be changed, right? This is a fundamental uh, thing. What, no matter what kind of socialist, no matter whether you are someone who thinks, who is rather pessimistic of the ability of existing movements to change things and thinks that, you know, historical forces uh, tend to act without, uh, independent of human willpower, whatever kind of socialist you are, you, you don't believe that the relationships between people that so discomfort you uh, are destined to persist forever. You understand that these are things that are created in a particular kind of society. Um, you know, the classic definition of, of socialism has always involved, uh, you know, owning the means of production, right? Uh, has always involved um, workers uh, being in charge of their workplaces and of their tools and no, no longer feeling uh, that they are um, at, uh, I, think, I think Marx's phrase, he said, you know, at, at home, uh, not, they're not at home when they're at work, they're at home when, you know, they're, they're uh, I'm gonna botch it. Anyway, point is, the, the, the thing is the socialists uh, have always understood that there's something wrong with being at the, at the workplace, right? Because you don't own it, because you don't participate. Um, and that, that, and that can be different. And so, and that, it, and that the existing structure of most workplaces is dehumanizing. And, 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 and that's, that's really central. Socialists have always centered the workplace. But there's more to it, right? The means of production definition of socialism can't capture everything because there's, more, there's always more to it, um, which is that uh, socialists are anti-racist. They are feminist. Uh, they are, you know, there's this awful headline today, I don't know if you saw, about uh, the mass hysterectomies at the ICE facility, right? And that is something that every socialist is disgusted by and, and, and revolted by. Um, but it's not quite it's it's uh it's only tangentially related to the analysis of the workplace and the means of production right so there is something more in socialism than just wanting the relationships between worker and boss to be adjusted and i think when i when i thought about what that more is right and when i talked to all these dsa members around the country to ask them you know what what is this? Where do you start? What, do, what, what kind of feeling do you have, right, before you get into the theory? Um, there are two, two classic uh, sort of socialist quotes, right, which really capture it, which is, um, you know, Eugene Debs has this, uh, the, while there is a lower class, I am in it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. While there's a criminal element, I'm of it. And, um, and that's a wonderful, I mean, I, you know, you hear these things so, so many times that they lose their meaning, but it's a wonderful expression of what solidarity is. And, and it captures the way socialists look at lots of different situations, which is, it's a very, very radical statement. While there's a single soul in prison, I am not free. So socialism is a prison abolitionist philosophy from the start, or at least it believes in a, the possibility of a world without prisons, because if there's a single soul left in prison, you are not free. Um, and so, and it, it captures what socialists feel like when they look at the immigration detention system, uh, what they feel like when they look at um, the ravages of climate change, right? And there is this, this real feeling of solidarity with your, with your fellow people. Um, there is, uh, and, and this is what is kind of beautiful about the, about the core uh, of socialism, is, the, is that the socialists feel they have kind of a heightened uh, they have, I mean, it's you know, heightened empathy sounds like excessive praise, but there's a, there is a real sense that my life is tied to your life and that it matters to me what happens to you. And, and you could hear echoes of the Eugene Depp sentiment in Bernie Sanders' great speech that he gave uh, in New York, where he said, you know, I want you to fight for someone you don't know. And the interesting thing about that was it was not just that you did not know them, but it was also that you didn't have their problems, that their problems were not things that affected you directly. He talked about, you know, even if you do not have student debt, 
you fight for the person without uh, with who does have student debt and that's that's a, that's a kind of, that's the kind of, that's the solidarity right it's easy to fight for your own self interest um, but socialism says we all rise and fall together while there's a soul in prison I'm not free even though. I am not necessarily in prison. Um, so socialists begin there with, I think, solidarity and uh, the rejection of class distinction is such an important part of it before we get to the question of markets, because there are market socialists, non-market socialists, right? Um, so before you even get to, to, to that question, I think, I think that's, that's where it begins. And that's what you, what you hear from DSA members around the country, right, is they, they have this sense that things can, be, things can be very different and they have to be very different. Um, and so, and socialism is also quite practical. Um, you know, Occupy Wall Street was kind of the first real outburst of the rejection of extreme inequality in our country in our time. And, but it wasn't, I, I don't think it would be described as socialist. It was more kind of anarchist. Um, and that's in part because socialists have historically been both utopians and pragmatists. The people who self-describe as socialists, um, they think, you know, as Jeremy said, a lot of what you're going to be doing in this night school is strategic, which means you don't just think, well, uh, wouldn't it be nice if you think, well, hang on, how is power arranged and how do we seize it? You know, you think, you think about those, those difficult questions because you believe that it's actually possible. So the strategic component of, you know, if you look at the American Socialist Party in the early 20th century, um, you know, they were quite successful in part because they were quite pragmatic. Um, and there were there are always arguments within socialism about how, you know, how much you can compromise for the sake of, of gaining power, how much you can do electorally, you know, what what you can what you can do outside, you know, how important is labor, right? But these are all strategic and pragmatic discussions um, about how you take those those val those sort of mushy values that you start with those feelings of solidarity and the feeling of disgust at, at, at a class system um and then and then what you actually do in order to take the world around you and, and really um really change it um there are there are three points i actually i actually was i uh, thought uh so there's socialist values um and then there's the socialist analysis and the socialist analysis is trying to understand what is actually going on around you, right? The, the socialist perspective has always been, we, we can't just have this feeling of wanting to turn away this, uh, the, an outrage, right? We, we also have to understand what, what is causing things to be the way they are. So, so socialists have always, that's why I say it's such a rich intellectual tradition because it looks carefully at the world. Socialism has a kind of social science um, component. And, um, and so, you know, when socialists look at the climate crisis, for example, they see what the, what the economic roots of that are. They understand that, you know, they understand the, the ceaseless capitalist desire for profit and the effects that it has. And they notice, they draw a connection to it. And that, again, that's a very basic one, but that's something that is not noticed by you know, the Democratic Party, for instance, right? That's not, these are, these are pretty simple things a lot of the time, right? But they are also things that are very, very out of the, out, out of the mainstream. And uh, so socialists try to understand why, you know, why don't reforms work, right? Why don't liberal reforms work? Why, why was Obamacare so inadequate? Um, and the answer to that, right, from a socialist, is, well, because Obamacare was predicated on you can't do anything to disturb the existence of the insurance industry. And if you predicate your reforms on that, since the insurance industry is the big problem with the way we insure people, um, you, you can't fix it. So you can only fix it if you're a socialist, because you only understand it if you're a socialist. Um, you only understand what's going on. Um, and so, you know, when you become a socialist, you, you, you really, it, it, it's a wonderful experience. And I think, I think those of you who are kind of new to DSA are, are really going to enjoy this night school because it's a very, it's a very clarifying uh, experience to engage with socialist analysis it, because it's intelligible. It makes sense of things in a, in a way um, because, you know, so many of the ideas that you, you are fed are, are kind of inconsistent with the reality that you see around you. I spend a lot of time debunking libertarian economic arguments, but the real debunking of them is the reality that you see in front of you. 
right? <laughs> the, the, this discussion of the free contractual relationship. Well, we don't want to disturb free contractual relationships. Well, if you actually look at how the contract between an Amazon fulfillment center worker and Amazon is made, uh, there's, no, there's no negotiation of contract. It's very clear that there's a, a giant power differential. So you kind of understand what the, the, this, this kind of freedom is illusory. And we, so we have to have a better and richer definition of freedom, which uh, socialists have, have tried to put forward. Um, and uh, I actually wanted to just discuss a couple of concepts from Marx, who I'm sure you'll get into. I'm actually uh, kind of known for, for being down on Marx, which is a shame because uh, yeah, it's my own fault for irresponsible tweeting. But, uh, but, but I actually think that there's so much rich and of value in, in Marx's uh, work. And I wanted to pick just, it's just three concepts that kind of change your, uh, that, that he understood that, many, that hardly anyone else does. And that are kind of the, you know, Marx, way before any of us is 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 comes into this world of uh you know the, this relentless capitalism around him and tries to understand what is actually going on recognizing that the economists of the time don't seem to have good explanations for what is actually happening they don't actually go into the factories the dark satanic mills they don't see what is going on they are they are missing the core of the they are missing the relationships between people and so, um, so first, I think you know the, the concept of uh, commodity fetish fetishism really it opens your eyes, right? Wallace Shawn has this great passage about how how he was so confused by that term commodity fetishism, and then he 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 grasped it, which is the, this idea that when you look at all of the objects around you, um, you just see them as objects, you just see them as as, as commodities but you know Marx what, what one of Marx's great gifts to us is, is saying but hang on a moment let's 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 go deeper let's see let's see these ordinary things as things that are strange to us let's defamiliarize ourselves and let's think about all the relationships between people that are embodied in those objects who makes them who tells those people to make them why do they make them how did it get here how did the how how was what was made in order to get it here? How was that made? And uh, you know, and Wallace Shawn talks about how you know the, his cup of coffee contains the history of the peasants who picked the beans. How some of them fainted in the heat of the sun, some were beaten, some were kicked. And he said, I, well, once I'd seen that, I felt this fetishism of commodities everywhere. Um, so there's so that's a that's a wonderful. I mean, just that small, that small concept in Marx is such a, is such a gift because it causes you to analyze and understand everything around you. Um, and, and part of being a socialist is looking at things that seem normal and wondering if they're wondering what, what's on a deep, going on on a deeper level, right? For example, if you're at a restaurant, there's the front of house and the back of house, the front of house where you eat, the back of house where they make the food. Well, it's very, very few restaurants, some restaurants, they make the food in front of you, but a lot of restaurants, they don't. And partially that's because the back of the house is a whole different world. It's a world of exploitation. It's a world of, of, of misery. And if you saw it, you wouldn't be comfortable eating your dinner. So there has to be this, so, so there's, this, there's this fake world created on top and then there's the, the world of labor underneath it. Um, another important thing that Marx noticed that no one had noticed up until that time was the relentlessness of capitalism. And this is, this is, what, uh, this is why Joseph Schumpeter, who was a very pro-capitalist, free market economist, uh, thought that Marx was, was brilliant because, you know, Marx understood that uh, capitalism was something that would never stop, that it, was, that it revolutionized everything it touched. And this is why the conservative critics of, of Marxian socialism never understood it, because they, don't, they say, well, look at, cap look at the way that capitalism increases production. Well, that's a huge thing. The Communist Manifesto says it better than they did. Right, it's a and and you see it all around you, and this is the capitalism revolutionizing everything. It will, it will never stop. You know, Jeff Bezos uh, thought of his original name for Amazon was Relentless.com, and he's made it clear his job is empire building. It's relentless. It never stops. How much will be enough? No amount will ever be enough, and that's so important. Um, there's that wonderful phrase, all that is solid melted, melts into air, the sacred is profaned, right? So everything that can be monetized is monetized. Um, the World Trade Center, uh, when the, when the um, memorial opened up, they opened a gift shop. 
And some families were offended by the idea that it would be a tourist attraction and they have a gift shop. But there had to be a gift shop because they made an economic argument for it. They said, well, we can't not have a gift shop. There's so much lost revenue. There was always going to be a, a gift shop. The sacred was always going to be profaned, right? Because this is, there is a logic that happens and you can't free yourself from the logic. Um, and then the other, and this is kind of the exciting thing that is uh, something that is often missed um, in the, what in Marx's view of socialism and capitalism is uh, this is again something that the that the conservatives never get because they always say, well, you know, again, you know, look at the way, that, look at all the bounties that capitalism has has given us, and in fact, in in the, in the Marxian conception, the answer to that is exactly because capitalism increases production and then it creates the conditions where socialism becomes quite easy and possible, right? Um, Amazon has built a, a giant infrastructure for delivering things. Now you, if you could remove the exploitation, if you could socialize it, if you could nationalize it, um, you would have quite an efficient way of delivering things, right? There's, you, you've, you've built all the stuff. Now the task is to seize it and to make it democratic and to make it fair and to make it collectively owned, right? You know, we, we have rideshare apps and delivery apps. You know, these things don't need to be in private hands, though. Um, you can have, you can have a, you know, a little piece of software. You can have a socialist worker-owned rideshare system. And, you know, capitalism's developed it, but we, our job is to socialize those things that capitalism has developed to make them operate for the benefit of all. Right, and, and this is why it's helpful to think in stages, historical stages of capitalism is followed by socialism. So you say, well, okay, we've gotten to the point now where capitalism's relentless growth is unsustainable and is creating misery and inequality. Well, now this is, this is the point at which we need to say, well, we, we appreciate all of these, these, these what, you know, we like our iPhones, Right, it, it, it's great that capitalism has given us, although you know a lot of the technology is developed in the public sector, but whatever. Um, but um, but that's what. But so once those things are developed, then they can be socialized, then they can be democratized. And I think um, a really important part of so these these pieces of socialist analysis they really clarify what is going on around you. They help you understand the things that you see that are, that are confusing and, and frustrating. And the, the other thing is that once, because socialism is very insightful, because socialists, uh, you know, go deep and try to figure things out, uh, it also means that socialists have actual solutions for things. The, the two most obvious crises right now are the health crisis of the coronavirus and the climate crisis. Um, as we see in California and Oregon and Washington. Well, you, you take both of those things and, and the root of the, fa of, the, of the fact that the problems can't be solved is something that socialists have policies to address, right? So the, the Medicare for All and the Green New Deal, which, you know, these are, these are not uh, the end goal. They are mean, they are the first step. But these, these are actual ways of addressing the giant crises in our midst. And they are, you kind of have to be a socialist in order to sign on to these things because even the most liberal people, right? Nancy Pelosi, of course, is a, a, a liberal from the deep blue city of, of California. And she mocks the Green New Deal as the Green New Dream or whatever. Um, that's what she said. Um, and, and the same is true with uh, Medicare for All, where you can't even get, you know, they, they just laugh at it. Well, but these are these are all these are like the very very obvious rational ways of dealing with a problem once you understand it, um, and so, you know, to get to to the last part of what I want to say is is, you know, is, is, socialists are practical. And socialists are the ones who are thinking about what is going on and how to alter it in a way that will bring justice. And you don't see anyone else who is plausibly even doing that. And this is why, and this is where I'm going to heap praise on the DSA, uh, is this is why the DSA is, 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 I think, inarguably the most important political organization in the country, right? Because it is the, by far the largest socialist organization in the country. Um, and there's, there's nobody else, right? There's nobody else offering 
the kinds of actual, the kind of radical politics that the times require. It's, it really is down to socialism or barbarism. And so DSA has been doing a phenomenal job of actually organizing and actually getting candidates into office, people on the you know, Chicago Board of Aldermen, people here in, in, in New York. Um, the, the DSA are the only one, the, the, the future is in all of your hands. Um, because the United States, first off, is, is uh, what happens here has ramifications around the world. And it's, it's been made quite clear by circumstances that the right is just going to descend into the grotesque you know, white nationalism of the, of the Trump movement. And that liberalism is never going to learn any lessons, right? The lesson of 2016 should have been, uh, well, maybe you shouldn't run these, these uninspiring establishment candidates. But in, and so they doubled down on that. And they're running Joe Biden now. Well, you know, a lot of us feel like you got to support him. But, you know, but it, clearly it's a failed strategy because Joe Biden is struggling well, even, in, even in the most favorable possible circumstances. And we all understand that if he gets into office, he'll be kind of a, a caretaker president who won't really do much. Um, you know, but if they lost, if they lose this time, they'll run Pete Buttigieg next time, right? The, the, the lessons are not going to be learned. So there's only one path. And the path is that socialists manage to build viable organizations and take power. Um, and we, you're going to have all sorts of internal discussions about how to do that, what to prioritize. These are in many ways the same conversations that the American Socialist Party had um, in, in the early 1900s, where they took over city governments and in many ways were very successful in running, those, uh, in running cities well. Um, they were actually very pragmatic, uh, they, you know, called sewer socialists, because uh, they, they focused first on fixing the sewers, which is not that radical, but it's necessary because people need, need functional sewers. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lesson there, which is socialists can, in fact, uh, flourish in a society that is hostile to, to socialism. But also, the fact is that the American Socialist Party was wiped out by the time of... Um, World War One, and and didn't really come back until you know socialism didn't really bounce back until now. There were many many. I mean, you had the sixties, but you know you, you we. So the lesson here is that first, there is a lot that is possible, and it is necessary for socialists to organize politically um, because there's no other option facing us. Um, but our gains can be lost very quickly. And this is why it's there's such an urgency to to what you all are are doing, why it matters so so much, why what happens right now, what happens in the next few years, um, is so critical. I think we can win. Uh, that's the that's the exciting news. I mean, we really should. It was very disappointing for Bernie to lose the um, uh, 2020 uh, primary. But the fact is that two times in a row now, a socialist has nearly won the major party presidential nomination, which in and of itself is just such a massive political change from where we were um, uh, only a few years ago. There's a massive transformation. The left is only beginning its renaissance in this, in this country. Um, we, are, we are just starting. And so I am very, very excited uh, and very terrified. You know, terrified because we all we all see uh, what could happen, um, and and excited because there's never been a better time, at least in my life, to be on the left. Um, there are so many wonderful left activists and organizations and and media outlets, and and, uh, and you meet great great people. I went to the DSA convention in Atlanta last year. It was just all, all these wonderful people working working things out together in a way that they and they're all committed to shared goals. Uh, and so it's, it's really, really exciting. And um, the last thing I say is that we have to, because we have to build, because we cannot be a small minority, um, we have to be outward facing, which means we have to be able to talk to non-socialists and get them and recruit them to be socialists. This is why what I, what I do every day is I write, I don't write for socialists. Right, I you know, socialists can read Jacobin. I write for non-socialists. 
I write for people who I write for people to articles for people to send to their aunt or, you know, I, I write for my mom, actually, who's you know, not who's pretty apolitical. I, I try and, and I think we need to think about that. We need to think, how do we explain those those values, that analysis and, and the action that is required? Um, and so I hope that one of the things that you will take from this night school is first, it will enrich your understanding of those things and you will you know, cultivate um, this, this very satisfying um, understanding of the world and this very encouraging feeling that we, we can do things that are going to matter. Um, and then also that you, know, you, you take that and, and spread it. Everything that you learn you, you can't, it can't remain in your head alone. You know, we, we have to, we, it's, it's so, so urgent that we figure out how to, how to spread a, a socialist understanding of what is going on and a socialist set of solutions. Because, um, as I say, you know, to invert the old, the, you know, the, the, the Margaret Thatcher slogan, there is no alternative. There really is no alternative at this point. There, 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 there are no answers on the right. There's no answers among centrist liberals. Um, social, all of the exciting stuff that is happening politically is happening in the socialist movement in this country. Um, and we all have, you know, these, are, these are horrible times in many, many ways. Um, and I know a lot of you are probably suffering from unemployment, you know, you know but, the exciting thing is that we are still part of something that is very, very valuable and is hopefully going to matter to a lot of people for hundreds of years, considering where the climate crisis is right now, what happens right now is going to matter to, for generations and generations. So think of your night school in that context. Understand that what, what you are learning here is incredibly important. The conversations you have, they are so, so consequential. And you know, not to put the pressure on, but um, it, it it really does matter, right? It really does matter, and so it's great that you are all here. As I say, I am privileged to be your first speaker. I'm happy to take questions. I, like you, am still just working things out, so I may not have satisfying answers to things. Knowledge is produced collectively, um, not by either the individual, uh, you know, genius from high on above. So you know, you we want a conversation rather than just you ask me for answers, but like, but you know, I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, so thank you very much for, for having me. I, um, and uh, I, I'm really excited um, for what, what you're all are doing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah, let's do our clap emojis. <laughs> um, amazing. I think that gives us a lot to think about and a lot to discuss. Um, when we move into this portion of the night school. Um, I know a, a few of our uh, political education committee members um, have some questions they wanna ask. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to go into a couple of ground rules. I know it's a really big group, so we just wanna make sure that um, everything goes smoothly and everyone who wants to ask their question gets a chance to. Um, so just a few ground rules we usually set down um, at every night school before we have a discussion is you know, just kind of assuming that everybody's here to learn. We're all at different um, levels of experience, um, always assuming good intentions and in being comradely and asking our questions. Um, in terms of how we're gonna do questions, um, if you have one, you can just go ahead and put stack in the chat. Um, and then in a minute, I'll, gonna, I'll uh, make the settings so that you guys can unmute yourselves and ask your question. Um, and Carrington will uh, moderate kind of um, calling on people for their stack questions. Um, and just um, take into consideration kind of other folks too. If you've already asked a question, maybe allow for others to go ahead of you first. Um, and please do keep your questions um, as brief as possible. Uh, please know like multi-pronged questions, keep them uh, short for Nathan. We'll probably take them in groups of two or three um, so that he can go ahead and answer them for us. Um, did I cover everything, Jeremy and Carrington? Does that sound good for community agreements? I see we've got a staff building up already, um, and I'll hand it over to our political ed members who um, wanted to kick off uh, with some questions. Um, thanks, Mia. So I think first we're gonna hear from Doug. Um, Doug has a question for Nathan, and then followed by Obi and Eva, and then we're gonna open it up to um, the staff. So go ahead, Doug. 
Hi. Um, great work there, um, Nathan. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, Thank you. talking to us. Um, and um, what about Joe Biden? Oh, I was just kidding. That's not. Oh, God. <laughs> um, this doesn't follow from anything you specifically said, but it's something okay. I wonder uh, a lot about. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about. It. You call yourself an anarchist and a pacifist. I'm curious how you establish socialism without a state and with an antipathy to violence in the face of the implacable hostility of the ruling class and the state that it controls. And since yeah. you have no intention of putting that, turning that state to our benefit, um, what's the strategy? Well, you know, I, I'm an anarchist in the same way Chomsky's an anarchist, right? Which is, I, and I, I've, I've got an article actually uh, on the, called The Power of Anarchist Analysis. And, and also, and, and I am a, you know, I call myself an anarchist, but it is in some ways, it, it is a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, the, what I tend to mean by that is that I identify in the kind of libertarian socialist tradition that has a radical skepticism of, of authority and a belief that we need to be extremely careful because states have a tendency to become dominated by small cliques of people, even when we intend them not to, and uh, you know, civil liberties are such a such a core aspect of, of of what freedom means. I came to socialism through the writings of anarchists, through people like Kropotkin, and through people like Emma Goldman. I tend to think, as you do, and that actual that anarchism is far better as a, uh, <laughs> a, a, as I say, as, an, as a kind of analysis than it is as a program. And anarchists d don't really have a solution for political organization. Um, and so there are, no, there are very few lessons to be taken from the anarchist intellectual tradition about how to, about how to organize well. Um, and so I, you know, I, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit, I, I mean, pacifism is kind of different um, because uh, pacifism I just see as a particularly radical strain of anti-war thinking um, that th the revulsion towards violent conflict goes further than um, is typical, right? And I, I, it is not, I, I distinguish my kind of pacifism from a kind of absolutist uh, pacifism, but it is a sense that, uh, you know, it is a deep, deep revulsion at violence and a deep, deep feeling that everything possible needs to be done before you uh, resort to, um, to violence. But you know, Marx was an anarchist too, in the sense that he believed in a stateless society. Um, Eventually. You know, the socialist goal has always been ultimately a stateless society. Um, th thanks, Nathan. Uh, Obi? Um, hey. Hey, Nathan. First of all, uh, thanks for signing my copy oh. of uh, Why You Should Be a Socialist. But um, my question is, going back to something you said, is there um, any real point in talking to people about socialism these days uh, because of how big the problems are should we not just focus on the issues alone um is this not exactly analogous but bernie sanders arguably did bad because he talked about socialism so um what's your opinion on this and um what's your experience it, i mean it's it's true that i think we need to be the one thing that we need to be careful about is not saying we're pitching you on socialism Right, I do that in the in the book, but uh, um, it is right. Bernie Sanders actually avoided uh, as much as he could saying the word socialism, um, and instead, the way he talked to people is to say, "Okay, well, you know, what's happening to you at work? What's your insurance situation? Do you notice what's going on around you? Well, you know, what do you think ought to be done about that?" These are kind of how you have organizing conversations. You take people where they are. Um, instead of saying, you know, let me explain the principles of socialism, you, you often in your conversations with people don't even get there, even though you're offering them a socialist analysis, a socialist perspective. I, I am a very strong believer in the power, though, of, of persuasion and talking to people um, because I believe that all all organizing is premised upon that, right? This is the all labor organizing is taking a look at, oh, well, we have, you know, only 10% of the people committed to join the union. Now we have to turn, we have to turn people completely around. 
Um, so I do believe uh, powerfully in thinking through like, how do you, how do you reach people? And uh, how, do you, how do you get to people? There, we can have discussions on the degree to which you let them know at first that you are radical, which is not always wise, but ultimately uh, you have to let them know. Um, thanks. Uh, Abba? Hi, Nathan. Um, yeah, just want to thank you so much um, for talking to us today. And I guess um, since we're talking about political education, um, what are some, uh, I guess, limited to three texts that you would recommend for someone who's curious about socialism or um, mm. want to learn more? Like, yeah. Um, well, I, um, let's see. I have, if you, if you, if you look at, uh, and I'm not plugging it, because you should get it from the public library rather than buying it. But if you look at the appendix to, to why you should be a socialist, I have a, a long list of uh, literature and, and things that I, that I recommend because um, it's, it's way more than three. Um, my, you know, I have, I, 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 gosh, I, I don't even, I, I, yeah, I don't even know where to start in terms of three texts because the other thing is that I've always thought that you, you kind of come to these ideas in your, in your own way rather than having i i've oh i've also done an article called literature of the left which goes through and it's got like 80 80 different books but you you can you you take your own route to it um so there are lots and lots of wonderful things in the left intellectual tradition um and you pick and choose the things that you are most interested in. You try and get a sense of the broad overview. My number one recommended book is always Understanding Power by Noam Chomsky, but, uh, but I think you, could, you, can, you know, can develop a perfectly good analysis without reading Understanding Power. Um, so I, I hesitate to just give you the three books that you ought to read, but if you want lots of books, uh, check the appendix and the article I did. Awesome, thanks. Um, and now we will go to the stack. So first up is Reed. Hi, Nathan. Uh, yeah, it's great to. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, greetings from Canada, where we're just uh, just getting the smoke now. Um, oh God. Yeah, and uh, my question is, I'll try and articulate this quickly. Um, as uh, something I encounter a lot in uh, left spaces is this kind of like very kind of leftier than now, more theoretical than now attitude, which, I, which I'm sure you've observed as well. Like, you know, you're not, you're not really a socialist unless you believe this exact thing about Marx or you follow this book to the letter or something like that. What are some ways uh, in which uh, we can, you think we should be able to combat uh, that so that we're not just kind of stuck in our own little bubbles and, and yeah. to doctrinaire and stuff? Yeah. Um... I, 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 do, I do think about this and I, I, I think, uh, you know, as I say, I, I've gotten, uh, landed myself unfortunately in uh, uh, controversy for, for being unnecessary, uh, unfair, r rather unfair to, to, another, to, to the Marxist tradition. Um, the reason that I sort of react viscerally against, um, uh, against that, against, against, Marxism, even though I, I adopt huge parts of, of Marxist analysis, is because I tend to feel as if what we need at the moment is a kind of hybrid of the various parts of the left intellectual tradition. So, for example, um, you know, Lenin was a phenomenal organizer. Um, Lenin also had a massive blind spot, and it was pointed out to him by another leftist, Emma Goldman, when she met Lenin, where she was talking about the necessity of, of, of freedom of speech, and she was worrying about the, the persecution of, of other leftists, and, and he, he was rather unconcerned. And that was a serious problem, right? The, 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 exist, the, the easy justification of revolutionary terror is a problem, right? And there, the risk of authoritarian socialism developing is a problem. And yet, even those who the anarchists dismiss as authoritarian socialists also have, again, often better understandings of how you organize politically. So what do we do now? Well, I think, unfortunately, in the history of socialism, their camps have been developed. Are you a reformist socialist or are you a revolutionary socialist? Are you a Marxist socialist or are you an anarchist socialist? And 
the camps have despised each other. They've hated each other's guts. Um, <laughs> and it split the movement. So we need to have, so we really need to have a, a, a starting point that says, you know, we, we are trying to work through what is best in each part of the socialist tradition. That's where I start. Um, and I think, you know, a lack of rigidity and openness to, to new ideas is, is foundational if we're going to get along and avoid the, the deep hazard of all leftist political movements since there have been leftist political movements, which is splitting, which is schisms. And that's what's so great about the DSA is that it's the big tent. Um, thank you. So next up is Afnan. Uh, hi, Nathan. Wonderful. Like, it was wonderful listening to you. Um, oh, thanks, Afton. I just had a, a question regarding, like, one thing that I personally worry about with the socialist tradition is uh, how it's, like, the, the country is becoming very divided where, uh, you know, like, Portland, New York, uh, these centers are becoming very socialist, while other parts are going the other way. But if we're going to have a socialist country, we need to, you know, bring what many people would call middle America, which, I mean, I don't want to generalize people. Yeah, right. It's not right. Um, so how do we really interact with those kinds of areas, like, um, like, you know, like, that are normally very Republican or very uh, conservative minded? How, how would you say we should interact there and build socialism there? Yeah. No, that's absolutely right, is, you know, the socialist strength in Chicago, socialist strength in New York. Um, but, you know, in what happens in the red states, uh, don't accept that it's, you know, the real America, uh, but it's, it's an important part of America and it's an important part of working class uh, America. Um, I, think, I think Bernie Sanders really had, it's, un, this is so, it's so unfortunate that he didn't win the primary because he had a real kind of theory that he was going to test which is that if you brought a kind of plain spoken honesty and a lack of condescension, you could probably win over people in areas that you never thought would be open to socialist politics. And that in many cases, actually the reason that these places are going so far to the right is because Democrats have just given up on them. I mean, there are red congressional districts that Democrats don't run candidates, not because they couldn't win, but because uh, they, they're not part of the overall strategy or whatever. Um, in fact, you know, there's no Democrat running against Tom Cotton in Arkansas right now. There's no Democrat. The Democrat dropped out. Um, so you need to run candidates and you need to, you need to try, you actually need to try to organize in these places. It is extremely difficult. There is no, this, this, is, this is an experiment and it is going to be iterative. It is going to be figured out over time. Um, but I think Bernie had a great way of talking to people um, from, you know, he, could, he went to Liberty University. He talked to Trump supporters. He got them all applauding for him. He went on Fox News. He got all them applauding for him, right? Because he, he understands how to, how to communicate socialist ideas really, really well. And that's why he won a lot of primaries in places like Oklahoma, um, because, you know, people, people like that. He seems like a normal person. So it's going to be difficult, but he, that's, a, that's a good starting point. Thank you. Um, next up is T, followed by Jeremy. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks to DSA uh, for putting on this night school. And thanks to Nathan for being here tonight. I really love the work that you and Current Affairs are doing. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, and I actually had a similar question because okay. when you were speaking about how a lot of your work is actually trying to bring people into the fold of socialism, I'm kind of in a similar boat, but I go back and forth with whether that's even worth the energy or not, because mm. sometimes it seems like such a Sisyphean task where in so many ways we're dealing with yeah. another red scare if the first one ever ended, where as soon as they hear that you care about things like Medicare for all or social justice, yeah. like, oh, you're a commie. And it's just like, well, is there yeah. even any, yeah. is yeah. there any worthwhile energy spent trying to convince people like this because as you also said earlier, people who tend to conclude that they're socialists or even commies uh, already kind of came to a lot of these belief systems mm -hmm. independently and then applied the labels later. So just yeah. really from a practical standpoint, how do you decide when it is and isn't worth even using your energy? 
Yeah, I mean, this is, well, it, it varies from person to person, right? There are people you can't reach. There are people who have so far gone into Fox News QAnon territory that, like, you, you talk to them for 20 years and you're never going to bring them around no matter how good your arguments are. Um, so it, it, when you're talking on a person to person um, basis, it's actually easier for me, right? Because I literally have a filtering mechanism where only the open minded people read my articles, because by definition. So a lot of people who read my stuff are like, you know, someone who likes Jordan Peterson, but like some, some friend of theirs sent them this article and they're like, I'd like you to consider this about Jordan Peterson. And then they read it and they go, yeah, wow, that's true. And then they email me and they go, you really changed my mind on Jordan Peterson because they were kind of an open minded person. So, you know, I, I, as I say, like, I, I just throw stuff into the wild and the, and, uh, and the people who are persuadable get persuaded. Um, but on a, on a, in an organizing uh, context, um, there are tips and tricks for conversations, right? Which is that, that, that labor organizers developed over a hundred years. Um, for how you sit down and take someone who thinks they hate you and goes, well, well, okay, but what happened to you last week? They go, well, I, you know, they didn't pay me for my overtime. You go, well, is that, is that right that they didn't pay you for it? You go, well, that's what happens. You go, well, does it, does it have to happen? Do you think that's, do you, um, so, so you, you know, there's those kinds, there's organizing conversations. Um, and for those, you just, you've really got to just feel out pretty quickly where your energy is is best spent it has to be done because as i say we don't you know the percentage of the country that are socialists is so is so small still uh dsa is massive you know for a socialist organization but it's tiny for a national political organization or it's at least as tiny compared to the democratic party um so uh yeah it's a, it's a it's a it's a matter of feel uh, about when your conversation, when it's worth talking and, and how to approach it. Sorry, that's not more uh, definitive. <laughs> thanks. Um, next up is Jeremy. Yeah, thanks again so much, Hi. Nathan. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up, I think what you said about externally, being externally oriented and external orientation is so important. And I think mm. one, First, I'd like to hear just if you have sort of thoughts about ways to do that, sort of like habits of mind or of, or, you know, sort of like uh, how you talk to people in ways that are not um, sort of speaking to an in-group um, or ways that mm -hmm. kind of welcome other people into the fold. So that was one sort of part of it. And the other part of it is, I guess, sort of to go back to Obi's question about sort of the issues versus socialism. I mean, one of the things, you know, that, I hope every member of DSA does like often is canvas. It's something I didn't do before uh, working for, you know, volunteering for Bernie. And now uh, it is like a regular part of my life as a socialist. And it involves, you know, talking to strangers all the time about these politics. Um, but it is usually talking to the stranger about like an issue or electing a candidate. And the people who, many of the working class people we convince to vote for our candidates do not ultimately, or do not so far join DSA um, and mm. consider, maybe consider themselves socialists. So I'm wondering about that, sort of how we move the needle on bringing uh, working class people, not only to be willing to vote for our agenda in elections, but to, to identify as, as members of the socialist movement um, and to expand our ranks. In that way. Yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer because I am experimenting just as you are. And I don't, I don't do canvassing. So people who do canvassing are going to have better understandings of how you have one-on-one -on -one conversations. I do media. And so my untested, unproven experiment is the thinking that maybe through building an, a neutral looking uh, media organization, we called it current affairs so that it didn't give away the politics. Um, you could, you could hook people and then, and then go, by the way, uh, have you heard of, uh, have you heard of the democratic socialists? And, um, I, I, you know, whether it'll work again, everything is experimental right now. We are, we've never, we've never done this before. Uh, so we're going to be trying things and uh, seeing what works. We should study very carefully. This is the other thing. We shouldn't just study socialists because socialists haven't won historically. 
you got to study everyone. Do you know the Trump campaign right now is having all of its door knockers read the Obama, uh, the book about the Obama's organizers. So we should study like the Pentecostal movement. This Pentecostal movement is growing. They get like 50,000 new Pentecostals around the world every day. Well, how? I mean, they're organizers, right? They have, a, they, have a, they have an ideology, but the ideology doesn't do the work. People do the work. So, you know, study everyone, uh, even people that we loathe. Um, successful political movements, we need, to, we need to understand. Successful religious movements, because we are in, in some ways evangelists. We are bringing a set of ideas and trying to get other people to share them. So yeah, study beyond uh, the, the, the labor movement is one, is, one, is one tip. Thank you. Um, next up is Austin. Hi, Nathan. Thanks hey. for being here. Hey, Austin. Uh, I have a question about appealing to non-socialists. So I read in your Texas speech to DSA, that you mm. quoted Debs and Bernie yeah. and yeah. their moral appeals saying, are you willing to work yeah. for someone you right. don't know? And I'm conflicted about that because it's such a beautiful sentiment. Mm. But at the same time, I recognize that under capitalism, we've all been conditioned to be so individualistic and it's creeped mm. into our ideologies and our headspaces. So um, I'm wondering your thoughts about yeah. like using the idealistic approach of this is the right thing to do versus um, the materialist yeah. approach of like this is right. in your own personal interest we yeah it, it's true because when you are trying to you can't you can't just appeal to benevolence and, and altruism socialism is good for people and it is and and you are trying and you have to appeal to people's self-interest when you are I, I think but i think this is again i think i think organizers try and balance this right which is uh, if you go in too far in one direction or the other you fail because if you go too far in the you should join the union because it's good for you direction then anything that happens that isn't necessarily good for you um you're going to see as a as a betrayal why should i be part of this if it isn't actually helping me um so you have to try and cultivate feelings of solidarity um, but at the same time, as you say, you can't just say like, are, are you willing to die for the guy over there? And first it's like, no, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to live my life. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, very delicate balance, but I think, I think you, I think one, either one without the other can be, um, uh, can be very damaging. I, I would caution against purely appealing to people's self-interest and that's why i think though but that's why i think that bernie does a good job because he said that thing about fighting for someone you don't know but that's not all he said right he also said you know when when you go to the doctor you shouldn't have to pay um so he had part of part of his message appealed to almost everyone right almost everyone has one of the problems that are addressed by his agenda but not all of the problems so you know, you, you are offering each person something. Um, thank you. So next up is Zavi, followed by Ryan, and then Mac. Zavi? Hey. Uh, so. Hey. Um, thanks again for the talk. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my question is more about like the experience as a Latin American talking to other Latin Americans. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm on a socialist train for almost a decade now. And when it comes to having conversations with other Latin Americans, we have this confirmation, not confirmation bias, but some kind of filter bias, right? Where a lot of the people who came here uh, for from from South America, or Cuba, oh, yeah. Yeah. they they have stories that are very personal, very family oriented about themselves or their parents or their grandparents and how the socialists stole their shit basically. Um, and I've encountered this quite a few times, and it's yeah. definitely a roadblock for me. It's kind of <laughs> like, okay, I don't know what to say to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and. And, and, and while I understand the sort of socialist rebuttal of like, oh, well, that's when it's spun into authoritarian socialism, yeah. like that is completely yeah. unsatisfying personally, yes. Yes. but also like when you're talking to someone who has that kind of 
that kind of uh, history. So I feel like they're going to lag, so to speak, maybe like generationally in terms of like socialist might be coming less of a dirty word for general Americans and stuff. But yeah. it's going to stay there, I think. So to put it in question form, I just kind of wonder what tactic you might consider in that particular I, case well the the children of the expropriated are always going to be a tough crowd let's say, <laughs> say that uh, i i think there's no real way around that as you say in the united states you are going to have uh you're going to tend to have a population that is yeah, that came here that came here because i mean the same the same actually is true with uh, refugees from vietnam Right, who a lot of them came fl fleeing the, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the communist regime, and and you know the the people who didn't flee are the people who are satisfied. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, this this is tough. I mean, you could maybe you could start with the word socialism is a, is a, is a, is a huge problem is here right because they have the word in their head and the word in their head says is synonymous with authoritarians who take things from people and so i think maybe you need to get go back to those like questions right where we say okay well what is the what is the reality that we see around us? What is going on? What are the problems? Let's forget the term. Put the term. Put socialism aside. I have a different understanding of it than you have, but let's let's not talk about that because we're not going to get in. Let's talk about the fact that we both share because we're assuming this person is we think reachable except for this roadblock. So we say, okay, well, you know, let's take how the healthcare system functions. Let's take how it functions. What happens? Right? How well, you know, how would, for example, if the if the fire insurance system operated like the health insurance system, you know, you have private fire insurance and you had all these, uh, you know, uh, gouging people and people were trying to put out their own fires because it cost fifty thousand dollars to call the fire department, um, that would be crazy, right? And uh, and they go, well, yes, that would be crazy. So okay, so how does this healthcare system operate? Okay, well, how do we fix that? What what is the element in there that is that is causing a problem? And then you, I mean, you we could have built socialism without the word socialism. I think the word is very valuable because the word you know most words are co-opted and the word stakes a claim and is and there's a great beautiful radical tradition. But you can sell people on the ideas before they realize that they're socialists. And I think that's probably the, the, the beginning of how you do it, is you don't even, you don't even go near the term because the term is a huge landmine and you start talking about the ideas. Thank you. Uh, Ryan? Oh, hey, uh, Nathan, thanks for everything. Hi, uh, Ryan. Is regarding workers' cooperatives. Okay. And just kind of what role do you see them having over the next decade or so? Do you see them having any particular challenges or pitfalls or advantages given our current situation? Yeah, it's it's a difficult question actually. It's a very good one and there's a lot of disagreement among among socialists about about worker cooperatives because there are several problems with that are kind of inherent to the pure cooperative model uh, which in part one problem is that you don't necessarily remove the profit motive you just spread it among a group of people so for example if you know if an oil company was run as a worker cooperative all the workers would own the company but it would still be destroying the the world <laughs> right and so uh the, the 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 a lot of the socialist skepticism towards cooperatives has been about the fact that within a competitive capitalist economy if it, if a business is to survive um even if it's internally democratized, it is subject to the same sets of incentives. Now, I think that's partially true, but it's not completely true. Um, the, it's current affairs, for instance, um, we are organized as, well, we're not exactly a worker, we're collectively owned by the editorial board of current affairs. No, there is no profit, nobody makes a profit. Um, so we are kind of democratically run, um, I am accountable to all of the other people in current affairs. They can fire me if they want, even though I'm, I'm, I'm the editor. And I set it up that way deliberately. Um, and it works quite well. 
And there are other organizations, there's a wonderful uh, media cooperative uh, starting now, the Brick House Media Co uh, uh, Cooperative is, is, is organizing um, uh, a few different outlets to come together at, at, under a cooperative structure. And I think that will work. I think these, these, these things can work. You just have to be really careful because you might be creating democracy within a tiny, limited, uh, privileged sphere. If, if Apple became a worker cooperative, it would be good, but at the same time, it would, its function vis-a-vis -vis the rest of us would still be the same. Um, thinking about the model on which institution, companies and institutions should be run is very, very difficult though. And, and there are intelligent arguments for many different kinds of uh, models. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up is Matt, followed by Danielle. Uh, hi, Nathan. Hey, Matt. Um, so uh, we've had over 100 consecutive days now of marches uh, for Black Lives. Right. Um, organized by even in just New York alone, dozens of different groups, and each group seems to have a, a different goal on a spectrum, right? From minor reform of police practices, things like that, to outright mm -hmm. abolition. Um, so I guess I have two questions. I'm, I'm curious, first of all, what do you see as the gains of this period of this movement for racial justice so far? And then secondly, um, with all these disparate goals, where do we where do we go from here? Um, how do we make sure this movement results in true political gains, yeah. you know, actual progress, and doesn't descend into the um, I think you termed it uh, cargo cult politics in that article we were saying? Yeah, where it just looks like you know you you're doing something that looks like politics, but it's not actually having political effects, which is the that's the real danger that we can all slip into um, is that we everything we do looks like we're doing politics. You know, we're carrying the signs. We are, you know, we're having a lot of meetings, but measured in terms of outcomes, we are not actually moving things. Um, and I, you know, it's hard with this, with this movement because it's so, it's so powerful and so, and, and, and so good and such a healthy development to see this, this kind of resistance. But as you say, when we think about, well, yeah, one problem is that a decentral, a completely decentralized movement with so many different goals, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to know. And this was kind of what happened with, with Occupy was because there were, no, there were no core demands that were shared across all parts of the organization. Um, there was no metric of success for whether you'd achieve those demands. I think what is probably going to happen is that on a local level, you're going to see a number of useful reforms in places where there is some left political power, right? So you're going to see places like Minneapolis are probably, you're probably going to be able to push through maybe some radical police reforms. Then the hope would be that you are experimenting that you manage to establish some experiments with new kinds of ways of, of doing justice uh, and that some of those experiments work and then other places as you build a political movement can also impact. But I think it's going to be very fragmented and very local because it's a decentralized movement by its nature. Um, and then the, but that's, you know, but it could have very positive consequences. And in the long term, building a, a consensus that police, uh, like some form of, of, of police ranging from strong reform to abolition is necessary, um, is, is valuable if it, can be, if it can be followed up with political organizing and getting people into positions of power who can actually do things. Um, everything is going to depend on whether, whether that happens or not, or whether it just becomes a, a demand in, in the streets. And it's going to be, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't predict the future, but it's, it's at least exciting. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, next up is Danielle and then I'm putting myself on stack. Okay. 
Hi, Nathan. Thanks so much for Hi. coming. I thought it was really interesting the way you sort of describe socialism as a way of how we approach the world and look at the world. I kind of hadn't thought of it that way, but that definitely resonated. So I wanted to ask sort of, I feel like the kind of long-term workings of socialism and how I am involved in that makes sense to me, but I'm curious if you have thoughts about how to really engage as a socialist in terms of our day-to-day -day life and mm. uh, sort of what we do in our um, daily routines and things like that. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's uh, one of the discussions that has run through the history of socialism has also been individual versus collective action. So how do you act as a socialist in your personal relations, right? And, and there's, a, there's, there's often been a, a sort of skepticism about, uh, you know, moralistic socialism. See, socialism is just like a moral code of, of uh, you know, that's just kind of like, you know, love one another. I, I tend to think that it's important to, I think I, I tend to see my socialist principles as, tr as changing the way, they, it definitely the more, the deeper I've, I've come to identify as a socialist, I, I, the more it has in fact affected the way that I relate to other people. And one way is that I have just become a more, supportive and empathetic person. Um, I don't, I, you know, we all have difficulties in our, in our lives and I, I don't say that people shouldn't focus on themselves first. I don't say that people should be, you know, uh, um, ascetic or, or, or purely altruistic. I am in a, a position of uh, great privilege, but I, I, I try to the extent that I can to in miniature sort of enact the kind of relationships that I wish people had. So in this, in current affairs, in this organization, I try, we've tried to relate to each other in really, really supportive and helpful ways. We've tried to show solidarity and compassion and we tried to build a workplace that looks different from workplaces in which there's a lot of passive aggression and competition and backstabbing and rumors um, and instead is a place of openness and, and yeah, kindness um, and I've <laughs> I, I, I think I think that's important I've you know I've written some articles called things like let's we need to be nice to each other um, because it's also it's also a, there's also a practical component to it which is the more that you enact solidarity in your day-to-day -day life by showing that you care about other people's problems and that you're willing to lend a hand when you can um, the more they see the, the what the potential for the kind of world you're talking about is because oftentimes they have only experienced we don't experience nearly enough of that. We experience so much individualism, so much brutal, competitive, uh, I'm not going to help you kind of stuff. You're on your own. Uh, and so when they see a, a the, you know, if the socialists show up and go, well, we'll, we'll help you, we'll sort you out. Um, people, are, people really begin to understand through seeing it in microcosm um, what it might be like to live in a society that was focused on the collective good rather than uh, the social Darwinist individual good. So I do think there is an important component of socialism that can give us some guidance of how to be a person relating to other people. I don't always manage to live up to it, by the way. I, you know, I, I, I've done very unsocialist, unsolidaristic things that I, I, I regret. Um, thanks. So I'm putting myself on stack, which is, uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, so I'm on the steering committee for DSA's International Committee, and mm. we've been working on building up a good structure so that we can open up to membership, which we expect to do um, shortly. Um, but I wonder if you have thoughts on how DSA can best foster internationalism. That is our mandate. Um, you know, we plan to do stuff with, you know, political education and, um, you know, campaigns, anti-war work, um, eco-socialism and like economics and trade. We have all these different like little, little yeah. uh, subcommittees within the international committee. But I just wonder in general if you have thoughts about how socialists can sort of pick up the internationalist um, theme again and yeah, I, I mean, I from my from all my interviews of DSA people, people in DSA are not uh, they, they most most people in this understand the internationalist perspective, and I think um, 
the difficulty is how do you organize across countries? And inherently, the DSA is the Democratic Socialist of America, by which it means the United States. Um, and and that's, that's a bit of a problem in the long term. I mean, it's, it's true that the United States is a political unit, and so it makes sense to organize within that, that political unit. But really, I, I would think that eventually there needs to be a formal organization in each country that is the equivalent of the, the DSA. There needs to be, as, as socialists here are all coming together under one, one organization, if, you, if we are going to effectively work together, there needs to be, you know, there, there really need to be equivalents because otherwise you're working with 150 different, different groups, you're working on little projects, a lot of stuff is, uh, a lot of stuff is getting done, that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, you, you really want an inter the the fifth well, would it be the fifth international? You really need the uh, the democratic socialists of the world, of which the democratic socialists of America is one branch, and there's a worldwide congress every two years and what have you, and it's it's one organization because unless you have one organization, it's it, it is going to be a little difficult uh, to coordinate. That's that's one thing that I tend to think. People That's interesting. Do. So you're suggesting we could expand the franchise to Democratic Socialists of Canada, Franchises Democratic, <laughs> um, Democratic Socialists of France and uh, elsewhere. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, each country has to, you know, play, things, movements have to be organic. They have to emerge from, from inside. But I do think that the, the model of DSA, which is to have one central big tent nationwide socialist organization, I think that model is very, very important. And I hope that that model at least spreads. Um, interesting, thank you so much. Um, okay, next up is Lisa. Hi, uh, I have a question. I don't know if it's like entirely off topic, but a lot of socialism, <laughs> I think makes intuitive sense, um, but there are certain realms where I don't understand, and in particular, the military, because there's like this rising um, tension right now in the politics about, you know, China, et cetera, whatever. And I don't really know, I don't really have a great grasp of where socialism fits in that, because when I imagine like a socialist, like trope or fantasy, there is no military, which I don't think yeah. is, what is realistic or true. I was hoping you could share some insight on that in particular because my like issue is healthcare and military healthcare is ex itself like pretty has a lot of socialist ideals built yeah. into it so um there's just a lot of things I don't understand about it. I was hoping you could Yeah. Speak. Well, uh yes, I mean it, in fact it's a we should use the example more of uh Tricare uh, uh because healthcare on bases is is uh is done as you say in a very a very socialist uh, model. It's it's very odd actually that the United States military has kind of internal internal socialism with w existing within this uh, uh, you know a a structure that is not at all socialist. It is a difficult question to know how as a leftist committed to international solidarity and uniting the workers of the world, you would wield military power, right? If it was an interesting question always if Bernie Sanders had become president, what, what would his use of the American military look like? There are some suggestions in Bernie's voting record that there would have been, it would have been somewhat problematic his foreign policy. Um, and certainly it wouldn't have dismantled the United States uh, military overnight. I think this is an area, actually, one of the reasons why, you know, you are struggling is that we are all, we all struggle when we actually think about what is, what is the socialist. But I think all of us are sort of, most socialists are kind of have pacifistic instincts. And that's historically been true, right? Socialists have been the ones opposing uh, World War I, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War. The socialists have been the forefront of limiting American military action. And that's the easy stuff. There is, there is a lot that's easy, which is that like uh, uh, restraining the obviously negative actions of the United States military abroad, um, the, 
are that's that's kind of a no-brainer but then how do you deal with the fact that there are military rivalries between countries i think you have a general principle that you actually want to you know george bush used spread democracy but you actually believe in that rather than it just being cynical um that you want to de-escalate gradually tensions between countries that your principle is scaling back the military is in international arms control agreements and trying to create a peaceful world by uh, showing the workers of each country their mutual interest uh, in acting collectively the same way we do on a national scale. But there aren't easy action, uh, answers when you start. There are some easy answers, like don't you know, don't start pointless wars. But um, the uses of force is a very, very difficult question for socialists, and uh, we have not yet got perfect answers. Um, thank you. So next up, we have Brian, then Alfreda, and then Jeremy. Hi, Nathan. So hey. my question uh, relates to something we were saying earlier. Okay. What is your view on the constraints that the existence of states, by which I mm. used the word in the term, the 50 states, yeah. create the okay. growth of socialism in the US? Yeah, well, actually, it may favor us because, uh, we, in fact, we might not have exploited this uh, uh, sufficiently. The fact that you've got 50 state governments um, means that there are a lot of there are a lot of government miniature governments that those who oppose us have to keep control of right they always have to be trying to keep control not of one single office but of 50 different governments and in fact that's why and again if you look back to the american socialist party in the early 1900s a lot of their victories were in state legislatures because it turns out that in state legislatures, you know, hardly anyone shows up to the elections a lot of the time. Um, you can actually get people into office. And there may, it may be that focusing on Congress first is a, a more limited approach because we could actually um, really seriously dominate uh, state governments. And, you know, the, the, the balance of power in the United States between the federal and state government means that states are often very constrained on what they can do. Um, so ultimately, like, you know, having, having, uh, you know, 12 states in your, in your, in your pocket doesn't, doesn't get you uh, solutions to giant national problems. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, it actually presents uh, a lot of opportunities because there are so, so many elected offices in this country that, uh, uh, you know, are, are where the races are, are really easy to win. I, I actually, when I look at the state system, I think, oh, this is this is ripe for a uh, socialist takeover. Um, good idea. Um, okay, thanks. So next up is Afrida. Hi. Um, so something I want to ask was like something that we encounter a lot. I'm sure are liberals that maybe can um, identify the issues and um, kind of at like a face value, take them as like, yeah, those are problems, but yeah. not really um, cross that barrier into having like that solution mindset. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask about that. And also the capitalism, like how we talked about, it's not like natural, it's not an immortal thing. And it's something that can be changed um, and did come from somewhere. So how would you suggest like um, kind of speaking to liberals about that and kind of changing their mindset in that mm. way? Well, a lot of liberals are hopeless, but uh, they're lost cause. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when you get the cases like, well, you know, in, in the primary right, it was supporters of Elizabeth Warren, generally. It was people who saw the same problems that you do and agree on that, but um, believe in generally regulatory solutions and don't sort of have a deep criticism of the, like the nature of the of, of the workplace and i think one of the ways that you start to expose this start to bring people to a, a more radical understanding 
is, for example, Elizabeth Warren talked about being a capitalist. I'm a capitalist, she said. Yeah. And she said she, you know, she was asked by Amy Goodman, should billionaires exist? And she said, sure. Um, and, and one of the important things is to get people thinking about, okay, but what does the existence of billionaires mean in a society? It's not, the imbalance of wealth is an imbalance of power because money is power. Money buys you, you know, whatever, whatever you want, you know, money buys, it controls things. So how would you even theoretically have billionaires and have some kind of tolerable equality when some people have, you know, the existence of, of billionaires when some people are, you know, have vastly, vastly less wealth is inherently kind of a, a feudal system. And again, socialists always emphasize they get inside the workplace and they look at the real nitty gritty of, you know, okay, but how does a, let's take an Amazon fulfillment center, right? How does that place operate? And the answer is people are dehumanized in that place, right? It's a, it's a, it's a system, it's a tailorized um, system of turning people into almost literal robots where they're given as little bathroom break time as possible. Well, how would you change that? Would you have some regulations to make it a little better? Would you raise the minimum wage? Well, yeah, you should raise the minimum wage. Obviously, you should mandate bathroom breaks at a certain, at a certain time. But the problem is that there is an extremely powerful company that is always trying, always trying. And again, this is another thing that you know, Marx is really good on, is, is, is showing just how ruthless and relentless and how built into the system a need to constantly be, you're constantly going to be at war with this machine that is trying to squeeze as much labor out of you as possible. And until you change the actual ownership structure, until you change who's in control of this thing, that is always going to be the case. The same with, uh, the same with landlords, right? until you change who actually owns the houses rather than putting some regulations landlords are always going to be trying to and, and in fact this is a this is actually something you can get from libertarian conservative economics because libertarians often say things like well if you raise the minimum wage employers will fire people because they'll just make the other people work twice as hard and that's why just raising the minimum wage isn't enough because it's true that in a profit maximizing system that's exactly what they do because they're ruthless um, and that's and and that's why just trying to regulate the market often fails because it often causes them to to react in other ways that have negative consequences. So we need to think about, and again, it's difficult to think about practically how you adjust ownership, but how do you actually restructure who owns and in whose interests our institutions operate? Because until you do that, um, as you see, you're gonna be at war with a system that is constantly trying to grind you down. Um, thank you. Uh, next up is Jeremy. Hey, Nathan. Um, oh, hey. Again. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, sort of two related questions. One, um, what are some of the, I don't know, the common or the best objections to socialism that you find yourself sort of encountering a lot? And how do you, how do you respond to them? Um, I feel like part of what we do in political education is sort of like uh, get ready to inoculate people yeah. to socialism. Yeah. So I think talking through that is important. Yeah, that's, I mean, I actually, uh, again, if, if people check out the book from the library, I, I went through and I compiled the, the most common conservative arguments against socialism and what I think are some uh, good responses. Um, one of the things that, that happens a lot and it's not so much that it's a good argument, it's, it's more that it's a tempting argument. I actually really understand the appeal of free market economics because they tell this, this story and the story is all you need to do is protect people's right to their property and their freedom of contract and the government shouldn't intervene in people's relationships with each other, it should just leave them alone to be free. And it's actually very compelling in a certain way because it's a lot, it's freedom-based rhetoric. And it says, would you want big government controlling your life? Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the fear of big government because big aggressive governments can be terrifying and bad is, is, is a really compelling thing for people to sign on to. And this is why, this is one reason that the right is so successful because they've really got this incredibly powerful idea 
of, of freeing you. Um, and, and the thing is, what we really need to do, and what, we've, and what socialists have often historically done very well, is show people why this is a fraud, why that's not real freedom, and what it actually means to be a free person. What are the conditions under which you could live your best life? What, what would you need? What do you need to have taken care of in order to do what you want to do? What do you want to do? And how, how could that actually occur? So the, the best way to take this, this powerful conservative view of freedom is to voice and, and be able to articulate our own idea of a better kind uh, of freedom, one that actually works one that's real, one that isn't, isn't fraudulent. I have a bunch of other arguments. You know, there's people obviously cite, you know, well, socialism has always failed wherever it's been tried. You know, so I've got, you know, how, how, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to, you know, uh, socialists or just social Democrats or whatever, you know, whatever you want. Um, you know, we could go through, I could give a lecture on each of these things. Um, but the general principle in replying to critiques of socialism, the thing that will help you in lots and lots of cases is to say, well, okay, let's look at what is going on in the real world, what is causing that to go on, and what you would do in order to make it better. If you come down to those really simple things, you know, this is, I, I debated with a Cato Institute guy, and, uh, you know, I kept coming back to, yes, but you think employers should be able to fire people if they get pregnant. And he, he squirmed, he squirmed, because I was like, well, let's talk about what that really means in people's lives. And then they're really, they're, they're stuck, because the thing that they're advocating turns out to be horrifying in real life. So as soon as you draw it back to reality, as soon as you keep painting the picture, as soon as you keep the flames in California and people's minds, they're like, how are we actually going to stop that? Then you have a really, really powerful case. Um, I think thank you. you. Else it. Were there two? Oh, just, just really quickly as the follow-up. Yeah. Um, just really quickly. Uh, the one thing I was going to say is one thing I heard a lot in the Bernie campaign, which is something I feel like we don't talk enough about, is I did hear often some people saying, well, I support Bernie. Oh, oh, Jeremy, you've gone. Jeremy, you're frozen. I'm sorry. Jeremy, okay. Um, Jeremy, we're gonna come back to you. Uh, in the meantime, we've got Jasmine and Doug on Stack. So uh, Jasmine, Doug, and then Jeremy will return to you. Okay, hi. Um, hi. Thanks for talking, Nathan. Uh, so the question I have is, um, I wanted to know how you can argue against those who uh, say that without capitalism, there aren't um, many, I'm going to say in quotation marks, opportunities uh, like to become like without the opportunities to become millionaire or billionaire, there's then little incentive to, uh, to innovate and therefore um, society doesn't move forward. Um, and so oh. the argument is that, well, you know, private companies do things better and more efficiently right. than government agencies. How do you argue against that? Well, you, you know, what's so funny though, is that whenever you actually ask anyone, all of these, these capitalists, you know, well, why did you do it? None of them say for the money. Mm -hmm. It's always, they always say, well, I did it for the pure love of doing it. I did it because I, you know, Mark Zuckerberg would not tell you he was trying to make a billion dollars. He would say, well, I was just trying to make a good social network. So the question is, well, if that's true, if we take them at their word, right? Again, you might not want to take them at their word, but we take mm -hmm. them at their word. Everyone says they do things for passion. Nobody says they do things for the money. Now, some people do things for the money, but I tend to think that the people who do things for the money do the things that we don't want done. Because if you're doing something for the money, you're often doing something that has no regard for its social value because you're not thinking in terms of social value, you're thinking in terms of money. So if we think about what are the, what are the kinds of innovations we want and who does them? Um, there's a funny lecture by Peter Thiel, of all people, the evil PayPal billionaire and Trump supporter, where he says, it's, it's, he's talking to, to business students about innovation. And, and he says, the people who innovate never get any money. Actually, never because it's it's scientists, right? It's it's scientists and engineers. Well, you look at the billionaire list, the Forbes billionaire list. 
how many of those people are actually scientists and engineers who invented something? What did Warren Buffett invent? What did Ray Dalio invent? What, you know, what, did, what did any of these people contribute? And the answer is almost nothing. So if we're talking about innovation, well, the, in fact, the incentives in capitalist society are against innovating because people who innovate do not make the money. The people who make the money are the people who figure out how to get the person who innovates to sign over the rights to it so they can make a bunch of money off it. And in fact, Peter Thiel says it's monopolists. It's people who manage to just corner a market. Right. So, so I think, I think that's important to think about. Okay, well, again, when socialists, you always take things back to reality. Say, okay, but what kinds, how does innovation happen? Well, often, mostly it happens in the public sector, right? Because you release scientists to pursue just good things so they don't have to think about making money. So, and people do operate because of passion. Money is a, money is a very bad motivator for actual socially beneficial innovations. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, Doug has another question. Hi. Uh, earlier, uh, Nathan, you mentioned the Pentecostals. Uh, they're selling <laughs> salvation, yeah. eternal life, you know, in, in heaven yeah. with God. And yeah. we're selling a lot of struggle, unpopularity, you know, a lot of difficulty. Yes. Now, how much utopianism, which has gotten lost <laughs> over the years, yeah. do we you have know, in the mix? You know, so talk of like solidarity, less alienation, yeah. or should we just stick with free health care? Sometimes we, you know, we fall short in the emotional context. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, you, you might remember that Alexander Coburn had a thing where he talked about how uh, communist recruiters in the 30s standing on the street corner saying, we have our, our brothers and sisters are in jail in this oh, part yes. of the world, and in jail in this part of the world, and in jail in this part of the world. And you think, well... Gosh, I, I'm not sure I want to join them um, because uh, I don't want to be the next one persecuted. It's true. I, you know, in the book, <laughs> one of the sillier parts, I have a chapter on utopian thinking. And, and I, I was very insistent on putting it in because even though it's silly, I think um, it's, it's true that there is a, that we have to preserve that part of socialism that really nourishes the soul and is really fulfilling and is really satisfying to be a part of and where you where you where you're dreaming of something that you know that the dream is beautiful um it's not just it, go, it does go beyond free healthcare. it goes beyond you know establishing scandinavian style social democracy and it's instead thinking seriously about the gap between things as they are and things as they could be what is you know what could be done what is being prevented by the economic structure in which we operate. I recently had an article about the, the way that access to knowledge is restricted because, and what copyright does. And I thought about what would happen if all information was in fact free and people were compensated um, from a central repository, but every, everything was free to access, pictures, books, movies, you know, everything was, was accessible, was commonly owned and accessible to everyone. And you think, wow, but the, 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 the unleashing of, of human thought that would come from tearing down the barriers to scholarly knowledge, all the, all the paywalls and stuff, um, is just incredible to think about. So when we start thinking about what could be done, and this is why I encourage people to be utopian thinkers, even though as socialists, we gotta be pragmatists, because you gotta, you gotta start with the utopia. You gotta start by, by thinking, what is it that we could all do and are being prevented from doing? And that will fuel your passion, and it will make it so that even when we suffer and, and it's a grind and it's miserable, um, there will be something to, to keep you warm and glow. Uh, thank you. With that nice sentiment, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. Um, Nathan, thank you so much for um, joining yeah. us tonight and, and kicking off our night school. I hope um, we'll get yeah. a chance to work together again. Um, Anytime. We, co we covered a lot of territory, and I think you know we've got a lot to go, yes. a lot of good ideas to go forward on. Um, so uh, I'm just going to give a few announcements before. Um, uh, closing the Zoom. Um, so uh, DSA is aiming to uh, expand. We are, um, as Nathan says, you know, we are a, um, a big force in America and we want to be bigger and stronger so we can be more effective. There's a, there are a lot of um, battles to be fought and we need, we, need, we need all the good people we can get. 
Um, so that's our pitch to, you know, please join DSA, um, you know, come join, come to night club, or sorry, <laughs> night club to night school. Um, if you, you have questions, um, find out more and see if this is for you. Um, our next night school is Mar Marxist Economics 101. What is capitalism? That'll be two weeks from tonight, September 28th at 7 p.m. I think Jeremy posted the link in the chat. Um, we have a planning meeting for next Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, feel free to join that if you'd like to get involved with um, North Brooklyn Political Ed. Um, also, uh, an announcement from the North Brooklyn branch. Um, you can run for OC of North Brooklyn branch um, if you're interested in running for the 2020 to 2021 organizing committee. Um, the deadline to fill out this form is Thursday, September 17th at midnight. Um, upcoming, we have a branch meeting on Thursday, September 24th at 7. I think Jeremy's going to post that in the chat. Um, and then there's a socially distant summer social on Sunday, September 27th at 2 p.m. in Cooper Park. Um, if people can make that, that'd be great to see people in a safe, socially distant venue. Um, and then we have upcoming events. There's a link for that. Um, there's a lot going on this fall and we hope you will join us. Thanks everybody for um, attending and we hope to see you all again in two weeks, if not sooner. Solidarity. Thanks, Nathan.